Hey everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at chapter 36 from book 5 of Caesar's De Bello Gallico. Now you might remember that this book is focused on Ambiorix's revolt. Um, it's in the sort of the tail end of, or the middle rather of the Gallic Wars um, and we're looking at 54 BCE, specifically the winter quarters and this particular fort that we've highlighted here. Remember this is the one that's in the, the region of the Eberones. It's been attacked, right? Um, the Romans have run and they've fallen into an ambush, right? Which we've been seeing. So the narrative is going to pick up in the middle of the ambush, right? We're getting towards the end of it. Um, again, the Romans have been attacked. They don't have a very good strategy to stop Ambiorix um, and his men from, from kind of pulling back and attacking them when they run. We kind of covered that in a, in a previous video. Cauda has been wounded, right? You remember, um, or you might remember that Cauda um, got hit, right, in the leg. He's down. Sabinus is still alive. They're both technically still alive. But now you're going to see um, the narrative shift to Sabina. So Caesar spent a lot of time talking about Cauda and how brave he was in rallying the troops. The last Last time we really saw Sabinus, he was really not doing a great job um, and had sort of acted in a cowardly way. And, and Caesar had pointed him out and saying, this is not really how a, a Roman officer um, should behave. So that's where we're picking up, uh, you know, picking up the narrative, right? And seeing how these two men are reacting and what Sabinus is going to do. So before we dive too far into it, like I always tell you, the first thing you want to do is try to pre-read this and get a good um, idea of the vocab. Now, there are different vocab sets out there, so it shouldn't be too hard to find if you want to just use a Quizlet or something. I'm sure if you were to um, look it up, you'd find one pretty easily. Uh, but make sure you know the vocab, right? So practice it, do a, a Quizlet, Blue Kit, whatever you might have to do, Gim Kit. Um, just make sure that you really know what the words are because it's hard to translate if you just have no clue what the words are. So always start there. The other thing you want to do um, is you want to make sure that you're reading this aloud. So if you're working in class, I know it takes time and a lot of, uh, I've said this before, a lot of times we're reading Caesar in AP classes where time is very, very crunched. But I'd still recommend that if you can, um, read this uh, chapter aloud, bring it to life. You don't want to just translate it in your head. This way you can work on your speaking, your pronunciation. And if you have a classmate who can read it back to you, you can work on your listening skills, right? Um, you never want to shut uh, either of those parts of your brain off. That's how you learn language, right? Um, you definitely don't want to just work on, on translating it without actually speaking it. So doing that, working with the vocab, always really, really good first steps. When it comes time to translating, though, the thing I would recommend is the read and reread method. You've heard me say this a lot. Read through the chapter. Write down any problem areas you have. When you're done reading all the way through, look at the problem areas, right? Maybe it was vocab. That's always the easiest fix. If it was grammar, it might be trickier, but this is where things like commentaries can help you out. But the idea is you want to try to shore up the problems you have and repeat this process over and over again. So you read it a second, third, fourth time, whatever it might be, and your list of things you don't understand should be getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you hit a point where you're getting through the entire chapter um, start to finish without any er any errors that give you um, trouble, or very few, I should say, um, and that you're understanding everything completely. That's how you know you're in a really uh, good place to move on. And if you are uh, taking this for the AP, right, that'll lock it into your long-term memory um, so you really remember Remember what this is about. I know sometimes the the time crunch makes it so that we're um, you know trying to rush through and it, it really goes into your short term memory and then the AP test comes around and you just don't remember what's going on right so you want to do that it'll help lock it in and help you understand better okay so if you haven't done that yet pause the video go back work on it on your own otherwise let's read through it together right I'll read it to you. Um, give you a sense of what it sounds like. Not that my pronunciation is anything great, like I always tell you, but at least you can hear it and I'll work you um, through the translation. As long as your translation is something in the ballpark of mine, again, mine's never perfect, but at least it'll give you something to work off of so that you can feel like you understand it. Okay? So let's dive in. The narrative starts like this in chapter 36. You have his rebus, per motus quintus titurius cum procul amb ambioriem suos cohortantem conspe uh, conspexisset, there we go, interpretem suum naiam Pompeium ad eomite rogatum ut sibi militibusque parcat. Okay? So we're, we're focusing in on Quintus Titorius, which is Sabinus, right? That's his sort of full name that Caesar will use. So you have uh, Quintus Titorius having been moved, right? Permotus, there's the, the perfect passive participle. So having been moved by these things, right? Everything that's going on, right? He's kind of disturbed and he wants to fix it, okay? So this is his time to, sh uh, to shine. So when... Far off, right? Cum procul, far off, he had noticed conspexisset. Um, he had caught sight of, you might say, ambiorix, and it's ambiorix um, cohortantem uh, suos, encouraging his own men. So, in other words, he looks out into the landscape, he sees um, ambiorix, uh, you know, urging his men on, and he knows that he kind of has a problem. So, what does he do? Uh, he meet it, he sent his um, interpretum, his um, interpreter, messenger, you might say, right? 
So he sent to Ambiorix his messenger, Gnaeus Pompeius, right? Now this has nothing to do with uh, Pompey the Great or anything like that, right? But this is um, Sabinus's like runner, right? His messenger. So again, you can kind of imagine that they're on the battlefield and he has someone who carries his messages um, back and forth for him. And now that he's noticed what's going on, he sends this person um, to Ambiorix, okay? So the next part you have is Rogatum. Now this is a supine, right? So this is a form um, that can be a little bit uh, tricky. I know for my students, they don't always um, necessarily recognize this, but this, when you have that perfect passive participle, Right, so the PPP with the UM ending, right? It's it's in the accusative, it's expressing purpose, right? So a lot of times in English, um, we, we express it with an infinitive. Latin will use this supine. So you see this a lot in commentaries. The, the best way to probably translate it is just to ask, okay? So you're, you're, it's giving the purpose of why he sent Gnaeus Pompeius. So it says he sent him to Ambiorix to ask, right? that sibi militisque, uh, militibusque, so um, that he might spare parcot, meaning um, Ambiorix might spare himself and his soldiers. So in other words, um, uh, Cauda and his soldiers or Sabinus and his soldiers, right? So Sabinus is looking out, he sees what's going on, and he tries to send a messenger to Ambiorix to get this to stop, right? Because he realizes everyone's dying, and he's hoping he can, um, you know, talk to Ambiorix, and they might spare the Romans, right? So again, it's not the worst idea in the world, but as you can kind of tell, this isn't going to work, all right? But he's going to do it anyway, all right? And then it continues, and you have, Ile appellatus responde, si velet secum colloqui licere, sperare a multitudine impetrari posse, quod ad militum salutem pertineat. Ipsi, vero nihil nocitum iri, inque eam, eam rem se suam fidem interponere. Okay, so you have ille, he, right, um, responded. So the, the ille here, the he, is talking about... Um, uh, Ambiorix, right? So he sends a messenger to Ambiorix, and that one, meaning uh, Ambiorix, having been uh, having been called Apelatus, right? Having been uh, spoken to or called, um, so he responds. So in other words, he, he responded. He gets the response from Ambiorix, and it says, um, if he wishes to speak with him, right? Si velet secum um, colloqui. So, so he says, if you if if you want to speak with him, meaning with um, Ambiorix, and this is all indirectly here, but it says if he wants to start, wishes to speak with him, licere, it's permitted, it's allowed, right? It is allowed for him is kind of the implied thing, meaning for Sabinus, right? And it's that indirect um, statement happening here. But again, it's just it's just saying that Ambiorix is um, responding, saying, yeah, you know, like if if you want to talk, let's talk, okay? And he responded that, right? So it's kind of his whole response here, um, that he hoped, right, that he was, uh, that it, it was able to be permitted or he was able to be permitted by the crowd, uh, um, a multitudine, meaning the crowd of the, uh, of the Gauls, right? So in other words, this is saying that Ambiorix hoped that he would be uh, permitted by the Gauls, meaning by his people, to do this, all right? Um, and it says, uh, quod ad militum salutem perteneat, right? Um, that which to the to the um, the safety of the soldiers pertained. So in other words, um, it's saying here, this is all kind of going with um, uh, his statement here of what the responses of what would be permitted. And he's saying he hopes, like, yeah, that they'll allow me to do this, uh, to do this um, concerning the, the safety of the soldiers. So in other words, the safety of the soldiers or the thing which pertained to the safety of the soldiers is the thing that, uh, you know, Ambiorix is hoping um, his men or the crowd will allow him to do. Now, you'll see in a lot of commentaries, this is an interesting callback because remember, Ambiorix has always said, you know, I don't make the decisions, the Gauls do, right? My people do. I'm just the mouthpiece, right? So he's always kind of pushed off that responsibility. And that's kind of what he's doing here too, right? You know, sure, I hope, I hope my men will let me have a peace talk with you, right? It's kind of interesting wording here on what Ambiorix is doing. But again, he says, yeah, if you want to, if you want to speak, come on over, let's speak. And hopefully we'll be able to figure it out. That's the basic idea of it. Okay, and then you have this last part, ipsi, um, vero nihil, uh, nihil nocitum iri. Okay, and so here we have um, an interesting thing. It's it's nocitum iri. This is the future infinitive passive, right? The dreaded form that we're always telling our students, don't worry about it. You're never going to see it. Here you're actually going to see it. Okay, so it's a little bit hard to to parse out, but it would literally mean something like it it is going to be harmed, right? It's it's kind of what it is. The Better translation would probably be something like 
um, it would not be harmed or someone would not be harmed. Okay. So it's, if you put it with where truly and nihil, it's saying truly nothing would be harmed to him, right? It's kind of one way to do it. And the, or, 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 or he, you might even say, um, you might even put it with, with Ipsy and say that for him, right? For he himself, nothing at all would be harmed, okay? Um, or indeed, he himself would not at all be harmed. It, it's a little bit odd to, to, to do it in English and you have this rare future uh, passive infinitive, but that's probably a pretty good way to parse it out. So in other words, what Ambi Orx is saying is, yeah, come on over. You're going to be fine. I'm not going to hurt you is really what he's saying, which we can all agree in the middle of a battle is a terrible idea to believe, but that's what Sabinus is going to believe, right? That Ambi Orx is not going to hurt him. Okay, then you have the inque eam rem se suam fidem interponere, right? So he said that um, in in that matter, eam rem, in this matter, he uh, uh, he he provides his fidem, his pledge, his promise, right? Interponere is the providing part. So it's saying in this, um, he, he kind of gave his his pledge or his promise, depending on how you want to translate it. But he's promising him, saying, "Don't worry about it. You have my faith. My fidem is kind of one way to do it." Um, he says, don't worry about it. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're going to be totally fine. And again, this is a really bizarre thing for Sabinus to believe, given this is what Ambi Oryx said the first time, and now they're in the middle of an ambush, right? But again, because Sabinus is not that um, that good at, at seeing through the tricks, he's about to fall for it, which is a terrible idea, okay? Then it continues on. You have ille cum cota um, saucio communi uh, communicat, si videator, pugna et uh, ut rather, so pugna ut excedant et cum ambiorge una coloquantur. Sperare ab eo de sua ac militum salute impetrari posse. So he, right, um, uh, so that one, and, and here the, the ille um, is talking about um, Sabinus. I know it gets a little tricky because you're flipping a lot of illes and he's, and it, it can be a little tricky to realize or remember who's talking here, or who's doing what. But now we flip back to Sabinus. So he, um, communica, he communicates with uh, wounded cauda, cum cauda saucio, right? Remember, cauda has been shot right in the leg or stabbed in the leg and hit with a, a sling, if I remember right. So he's he's down, okay? So it says he communicates with cauda um, if it seems good, si wedeator, right? So um, the, the, the wedeator, it means like if he agrees is kind of the idea um, here, right? So he's saying, hey, we're going to, we're, we're, he's about to tell what his plan is. So he communicates this with, uh, with cauda. Right, and he says that they should depart ut excedan. They should depart from battle, and coloquantor they should speak, right, or they should converse together, or as one, you might say una with ambiorix cum ambiorge. So Sabinus has reached out to Cauda, saying, "Hey, if it seems good to you, right, if you agree with me, we should depart from the battle right now, right? We should leave what we're doing, and we should go have a chat with ambiorix because he's going to kind of end this." Is the idea. Okay, so now we're getting what it is that Sabinus kind of communicates, right? So he, he communicates, says we should talk, <clears throat> and he communicates that he hopes, sperare, right? We have the indirect statement here. Um, and he, we have the same, basically, uh, um, words that we saw before, right? So it's saying he hopes that um, it is it is able to be allowed or permitted, in petrare, or in petrare, rather. It is able to be permitted um, from him, right? And, and the ab eo here um, is talking about ambiorix, right? So it's saying that that he hoped that um, uh, it's able to be permitted from ambiorix, ab eo, from him, concerning the, the, the or his own and the, so it's going with salute. Let me rephrase. It's sua salute. So um, his own safety and the safety, right? It's kind of implied for both of his soldiers, militum, right? Of the soldiers. So in other words, he's saying that the same idea, right? Hopefully we'll be able to get a, a, a peace treaty out of this and it'll be okay, right? So he's trying to get Kata to join him on this adventure of talking with Ambiorix. And now we get the last line. You have Kata say, ad armatum hostem iturum negat aque in eo perseverat. Or, or persevera, rather. Okay? So here we have Kata's kind of um, response. So you have Kata, right? Um, he, he um, uh, so it's going to really be uh, iturum esse. So say iturum esse. So Kata basically responds to him and, and refuses, right? So negat, he refuses to go, right? Or that he would go. Iturum is really iturum esse, 
right? Um, the future infinitive. So he refuses to go himself, say, to a armatum hostem, to an armed enemy. So Cod is like, you must be out of your mind if you think I'm going to go to an armed enemy in the middle of battle. And um, in this, atque eneo, Persevera, uh, persevera, rather, he persists or he almost insists. So he's saying like, no, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to, to, to go talk to Ambiorix, an armed enemy, because this is not going to go well. So this response from Kata is actually very predictable based on everything we've seen, right? Kata didn't believe Ambiorix in the first place. He's When, when they were in the fort, he's certainly not going to believe them now that they've been ambushed, right? So Kata has a very <clears throat> sort of like simple stoic response of, no, you've got to be kidding me, right? And I think it's interesting that Caesar puts that in one line, right, of, of absolutely not. And you have the the persisting um, there. He keeps saying like, no, I will not see an armed enemy, okay? So the story is going to continue and we will move on to the next chapters. You'll see what happens between Ambiorix, Sabinus, and Cotta. But for now, um, the general idea, again, is that Sabinus has reached out. He wants to have a peace talk with Ambiorix. He's still thinking he could save his men um, and, and kind of get away or, or Ambiorix might let him go. He tries to get Cotta to go with him and Cotta's like, no, absolutely not. This is a terrible idea. OK, so just some things to think about as we wrap this chapter up. You want to notice, again, um, we have this insistence by Ambiorix that he's not making the decisions, right? He's just doing what the masses tell him to do, right? The multitude of It's just an interesting description of Ambiorix. And again, it's it's uh, really deflecting the blame, right? Where Ambiorix is like, nah, I hope, I hope we can figure it out. I don't know, right? But it also is part of um, the, the, the trick that he's about to lay, the trap, where he's saying, you kind of have to convince everyone, right? I'll try my best, but, um, you know, I, I'm on your side is kind of the idea that he's doing. Okay, which again is the trick he used on Sabinus to, to first get him to leave the um, to leave the fort. The other thing, again, you really shouldn't be surprised at this point that Sabinus is the one discussing a piece with Ambiorix, right? This should surprise no one. Once again, um, he's really not looking like a great commander, not particularly smart or strong. He's trying to get a peace treaty when they're all being murdered. It's not the worst idea in the world, but he should know at this point Ambiorix is not his friend, right? He's never going to give a peace treaty. Sabinus just keeps kind of being tricked um, by this man, um, thinking that he's going to do something that he won't. Kata, on the other hand, even though he's wounded, he continues to be the voice of reason. And he's the, the sort of role model that Caesar's putting up there is what a Roman commander should do. Like, yes, they are technically ambushed. They're not doing well. They're losing the battle. Men are dying left, right, and center. But he's still not going to negotiate with an armed enemy, right? That's a very um, Roman mentality. And Caesar definitely is putting um, the, the difference between this description of Sabinus and Kata right in front of you for the audience to see. And that difference is really striking, <clears throat> right? So you can't help but notice in the narrative, um, Sabinus and Cotta are really on opposite ends of the spectrum here. So again, the, the, the kind of structure of this whole chapter is interesting, right? Um, and, and again, it's all a way of showing one person um, is, is the not the role model, Sabinus, and the other one is, okay? Now, the other thing um, that I always find interesting about Sabinus is now he says, Cotta, you need to come with me, right? So he says, we want to speak as one. Una is the word he uses, together. And it's interesting because where was this before, right? When they were leaving the fort, there was no consensus. Um, Sabinus had no interest in having a joint mind. Um, he refused to, to listen to what Cotto was saying. Um, you know, he remember he's screaming for everyone to hear. So the idea of going as one and having one voice is kind of an odd thing for him to say. It makes you wonder, why are you doing this now, right? Where was this um, before they walked into this ambush? Um, the other thing, right, the second to last bullet point here, um, we kind of hit on, but it, it, you want to think, is it really a bad idea or wrong for Sabinus to seek a peaceful solution? There's no right or wrong answer, I would say, to this. Um, so I'm curious as you read it, what you think. But if, you know, if you were a Roman commander and you see you're in a really horrible spot um, and your men are getting, getting killed and you're about to be massacred, it's not the worst or craziest thing to say, maybe we can find a peaceful solution. Um, we're going to see it's not going to work, but um, I, I think the intention here is is more for Sabinus to kind of look stupid for asking this, just because of everything um, we know. But the general idea is not the worst one in the world. So if this is actually what Sabinus did, um, you can see why he might ask Ambiorix for peace, even though they've been attacked. Um, we just know it's not going to work, right? Ambiorix is not there for a peace treaty, okay? And that's what I have the last bullet point. What can we guess is about to having, happen given what we know of Ambiorix? You can already kind of tell he's not going to give a peace treaty. This is going to be another trick. He already tricked Sabinus once. Now he's going to trick him twice and we'll save what happens for the next chapter. 
Okay. But again, we have the luxury of looking at the whole narrative, the characters in here, right? Um, specifically Sabinus wouldn't have had that. So you kind of want to have um, a, a multiple points of view when you read this, right? What do you think Sabinus would have been thinking? Is it right? Is it wrong? It's easy to judge now, but in the moment, it's, it's kind of worth thinking about. So that's it for this chapter. It's not particularly long. If you have any questions at all, <clears throat> Um, you know, in the translation, there are some tricky parts, uh, particularly the supine shows up. You had that future um, uh, passive infinitive, which is kind of weird. If there's anything that threw you off um, or you're not sure of, feel free to put it in the comments below. I'm always happy to help you. Otherwise, just keep reading it. Keep practicing. Like I always tell you, the more you read through this, um, the more comfortable you'll get with Caesar style. Um, you should be able to handle it after, particularly if you're doing that read and reread method, right? After one, two, three, however many times, um, you should be able to do this without too much trouble. Once you hit that point, you know that you're ready to move on. Good luck.